Now let's talk about chapter 12, which deals with product and service strategies. When it's all said and done between this PowerPoint presentation as well as your reading, you should come away with uh, understanding of nine key objectives. Those objectives are to find product and distinguish between goods and services and how they relate to the goods services continuum. Two, outline the importance of the service sector in today's marketplace. Three, list the classifications of consumer goods and services and briefly describe each category. Four, identify each of the types of business goods and services. Five, discuss how quality is used by marketers as a product strategy. Six, explain why firms develop lines of related products. Seven, describe the way marketers typically measure product mixes and make product mix decisions. Eight, explain the concept of the product life cycle. And nine, discuss how a firm can extend a product life cycle and explain why certain products may be deleted. So exactly what is a product? Okay, so a product as, as defined by the book is a bundle of physical service and symbolic attributes designed to satisfy a customer's wants and needs. So typically we think of a product as having to be tangible. Uh, but it also can be something that's not tangible, something you can't touch or feel. Okay. The key thing here is it has to meet a person's need or want in the marketplace. Now, a product can be both a good and a service. So a service is something that's intangible. It's not something I can touch or, or I can feel. Okay. I, I can't smell it. A good is something that actually is tangible, something that I can see or hear, smell, taste, or, or touch. And believe it or not, there are some things that are a combination of both. Okay, so for example, let's talk about a service. So a service uh, would be something like a haircut. Okay, so I go and get a haircut, that's a service. I get my taxes done, that's a service. Get my car repaired, that's an example of a service. Now a good is a little easier to understand because I can see that. So if I go out and buy a candy bar at a store, well that's a good. If I buy a box of Tide at the store, well, that's an example of a good. Okay. If I go buy a Xbox, Xbox game, that's an example of a good. Now, the good service continuum, those things that can be a combination of both, probably the best example of that would be a restaurant. So if you think about it, I go in there and I get something that's tangible, which actually is the food. So if I go to Outback Steakhouse, I'm getting a steak and a baked potato and a salad and some bread. So I actually can touch that, but also, Probably has to do with the service. So, uh, how well do they uh, quickly do they bring my food to my table? Uh, how quickly do they fill up my a glass of, of soft drink when it gets empty? All those are examples of services. So, a restaurant is a great example of something that is a combination of a good and also a service. Now, let's talk a little more about a service. So, a service has a couple things to think about. Uh, think about when you think about a service. First of all, it's intangible, as I mentioned before. I can't touch it. I can't feel it. I can't smell it. Okay. Also, services are inseparable from the service provider. So if I go out and get a haircut, uh, if my haircut is bad, it's the same thing as my barber being bad, too. And vice versa. If I get a great haircut or a go have a great salon experience, the person who gave me that experience is also going to be uh, fantastic. So I really can't separate the service I receive from the service provider. Also, services are perishable, meaning that I can't put those on the shelf. It's not like I can maintain a, a um, inventory of haircuts or tax service provide, providing information. So they are perishable. Also, they cannot be standardized, I meaning that if I go to a McDonald's on, let's say, uh, where I live, Cincinnati Dayton Road, I might have one experience and could go right down the road to a McDonald's five minutes away on Princeton Glendale Road and can have a entirely different service experience. So it's really tough to standardize its service, uh, which makes it a little different from a, uh, a good. Also, buyers play a very important role in the creation and distribution of services. And the main thing for here is because typically, uh, you are actually dealing directly with the uh, seller in getting the service. So if there's an issue with it, 
Uh, you can say, well, I don't like this service. I want it redone, or I want a different car if you're running a car, for example. And then lastly, there are a wide variation of service standards. Okay, just think about uh, what your expectations are if you go to a Burger King in terms of what kind of service you want. Conversely, uh, your expectations might be a little higher, actually be a lot higher, if you're going to more of an upscale restaurant. Let's say you're going to the Pine Club there in Dayton, Ohio. So you would expect service for someone uh, at Burger King to be one thing, but then for a, the service at the Pine Club to be entirely different. So again, you have the wide variation of service standards. Now let's talk about the classification of consumer products. You can classify consumer products into four key categories. You have specialty products, you have unsought products, you have shopping products, and then you have convenience products. So what do I mean by a specialty product? A specialty product is something that has a unique set of characteristics and typically might be a little more upscale or pricier. So for example, if I want to go out and buy a Mercedes or a BMW, that'd be an example of a specialty item. So they're not everywhere. Uh, they are there, but not everywhere. What about unsought product? Those are things, well, you know what, quite frankly, I really don't want to use them unless I have to. Okay, you don't really seek them out. You know you need them, but you don't necessarily want to seek them out. For example, a funeral plan, okay, or insurance in case uh, you're going to uh, meet untimely death. Okay, in this case, I give an example of remedial math programs. All those are things that are considered unsought products. Now, what about shopping products? Now, shopping products are things that are uh, not necessarily overly expensive, but then again, they're not cheap either. These are things where you're going to have to do a, a little work in, in determining uh, what is the best product for you. So, uh, for example, uh, if I were to buy a smartphone, that would be a great example of a shopping product. Earlier we talked about the consumer decision-making process. That would be a great example of you going through all the steps of that process when you're doing a shopping product. Now let's talk about the last category, which, is, which are convenience products. Now those typically are products that we buy fairly routinely. So um, they kind of classify them into a few different categories. One is impulse items, things you kind of buy uh, on a whim. So if you're at Walmart or you're standing at the UDF and you uh, see a candy bar there for a dollar, you might buy that. That's an impulse item. Then you have certain staples, things that you're going to buy on a fairly regular basis. So uh, mom and dad uh, might buy milk. Uh, you might buy gasoline for your car in order to get to school and get to work. And then there are items they call, which are also convenience products, but they call emergency items. Uh, things like, hey, I uh, have a plumbing issue, so I need to find a, a plumber. I might get a repair kit. Or I might need to make a visit to the uh, emergency room visit type of thing. So all those impulse items, staple items, emergency items are examples of convenience products. Now here is a comparison on a couple key attributes uh, looking at convenience products, shopping products, and specialty products. Now I'm not going to talk about each one of these, but how you see going down the left they kind of give you some consumer factors and also some marketing mix factors on the left and again as I mentioned going across the top they get the different type of products. So for example the uh, planning time involved in the purchase uh, if you're buying convenience products, which are ones that are the impulse or fairly routine, that your planning price will be fairly little. Conversely, if you're going to buy something that is more of a specialty product, meaning you're going to go out and buy a, uh, a Mercedes, you're probably going to go through an extensive, long planning process in order to make that purchase. Let's look at a couple other ones. So let's look at um, the um, comparison of price and quality. So from a convenience product standpoint, that comparison, again, uh, will be very little, okay, because I, I, I know that I like Snicker bars, so I'm not going to do a whole similar process decision making on uh, which candy bar to buy because I know that. So the comparison of price and quality will be very little. Conversely, um, it's going to be considerable if you're doing something, uh, shopping for a shopping product, for example, if I'm going after a, uh, a smartphone or a washer and dryer. Looking at a couple of the marketing mix factors, uh, the price, again, for convenient products will be low. Uh, relatively speaking, for specialty products, it's going to be uh, higher. Uh, if you look at the number of outlets or distribution locations uh, for the convenience products, there'll be many. For example, I can always go out to you know a Walmart or Kroger or any other type of convenience store 
and get a candy bar, but then if it's especially product like a Mercedes, there isn't a Mercedes on every block in terms of being able to buy them. So again, this is a nice little chart that kind of compares convenience, shopping, and specialty products on a couple key important characteristics and attributes. Now, next let's talk about quality. Now, a lot of times it's hard to separate a product from the quality. Now, there's a couple of things that companies do in terms of continuing to work on improving their product. It, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the quote, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, that definitely does not apply when you're talking about total quality management processes. Because what you want to do is you want to be on this ever, never ending quest to improve your product and to have world class product and also have a customer satisfaction that is always continuing to grow and get better. Okay. And they kind of call this idea of continually trying to make my product better, uh, total quality management TQM. Now, there are many uh, worldwide quality programs that exist out there. Uh, the one that many companies strive for here in the U.S. is called the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. And when you achieve this award, which is not easy to, to get, uh, it's something that will tell your consumer or your customer that, hey, they have this award. You know they are a top quality type of uh, company. They also have uh, what they call ISO 9001 standards that have been developed internationally, which says that in order to be qualified as being a, a, a quality um, producer of products and services, you need to achieve certain targets. And if you do, again, that sends a message to your consumer or your customer that, hey, this company has uh, world quality processes in place. That know, which tells me that I know when I get my product, it's going to be a good product or service. Now, in order to improve and get better, many companies will go through a benchmarking process. So what I'm doing is I'm comparing the way I do things to uh, other leaders in the industry or companies in general, potentially. So there are three main steps or activities uh, involved in benchmarking. One is that I want to identify manufacturing business processes that need improvement. So look with, inside my company and say, okay, uh, what can I get better at? Then I want to compare what I do to folks who do it very well within the industry, potentially. And then once I do that, any type of outages that I have or differences, uh, then I want to implement some type of plan to improve my quality overall. And many companies do this on a regular basis. I continue to benchmark what I do versus the best so I can improve and get better. And again, as I mentioned before, it requires two steps or two key uh, important components. One is I have to look internally to what I do well. Then also I have to uh, look outside of my company and see what they do well. I, I know when I was at Ford, for example, we would benchmark internal processes that we did versus internal processes of companies even in other industries. For example, uh, we looked at how um, a Procter and Gamble handled their invoices of product type of thing compared to how we did our things, hopefully trying to get information on how we could get better. Okay, So uh, you can do it within the industry, and many companies look outside the industry also when it comes to uh, benchmarking, benchmarking, benchmarking uh, processes. Now I kind of want to shift gears a little bit and talk about product line and product mixes and those things. So a, a product line is a defining here is a series of related products. So for example, uh, P&G has a wide range of product lines. They have uh, detergents like Tide and Gain and Cheer. They have uh, dishwashing detergents like Dawn and Cascade. Uh, they have paper products like uh, Pampers and and Bounty and Charm. So they have a wide range of product lines. Then you have the product mix. Okay, so product mix uh, with that would be, for example, using our current analogy of Procter and Gamble, a product mix with which is the number of product lines, a firm offer, which were the ones I kind of gave an example a few minutes ago. So all those from the um, different categories from detergent to dishwashing detergent to payroll products, to personal care, to 
home care, all those things we consider product mixed with. Products mixed length, which are the number of different products a firm sells. So that would be from Tide to Duracell to Crest to Loves. All those are products that uh, P&G sells. And then you have what's called product mixed depth. So if you look at one product line, what are all the different things they actually offer within that product? So for example, uh, you have Tide powder. Even within Tide powder, they'll have you know different scents. They'll have you know bleach or no bleach. You have a uh, Tide liquid, the same thing. They'll have different scents. They'll have some that will have bleach and, and no bleach. And also now they've added one product recently, which are Tide pods. So you just go ahead and take this nice little square little product line, throw it into the uh, wash and dryer. You have to worry about adding to the wash. You have to worry about anything. So th that's an example of product mix. Now on this particular uh, slide, what I want to talk about is the idea of line extension. So that's where I'm taking a current product and I'm going to extend it out a little further. So when, uh, as I mentioned before, when Tide had Tide liquid and they had Tide powder, and then when they added Tide pods, that's a great example of doing a tie, doing a line extension. So if they were to come out with something else that related to the detergent field uh, or the or the um, clothes carrying field, that would be an example of a line extension. Now, uh, one of the reasons that uh, companies will go through extending their line is because they're trying to extend the life of the particular product. So like people, products go through a life cycle. So they go through four different stages. You go through an introduction stage. You go through a growth stage, you go through a maturity stage, and also a decline stage. So an introduction phase is when uh, you first come out with a particular product uh, in the marketplace. I don't know if you remember, but we watched a, a clip of a Shark Tank episode where a gentleman had a company called Wall RX, where he had a way of patching a hole in a wall, uh, which is very similar to drywall, but it didn't require any type of mixing or any type of spreading, it was already pre-made. That's an example of a product that is definitely in the introduction phase because there aren't many competitors in the marketplace for that particular product at this point in time, if any at all. Then you go into the uh, growth phase. So in a growth stage or phase, you're going to see sales volume rise rapidly as new customers make initial purchases and earlier buyers repurchase the product as well as you get more competitors into the marketplace. Uh, and then once you do that for a while, then you'll get into what's called the maturity phase. In the maturity phase, you'll have a sales of a product category. It'll continue to grow uh, during the early part of the stage, but eventually it's going to kind of plateau and kind of level off. Uh, and then you're going to have a, uh, you see a slight dwindling of customers buying that product. And then uh, all products then will go through what's called a decline stage where innovations or shifts in consumer preferences bring about an obsolete decline in industry sales. And you go through this for every product. So for example, in the growth phase right now, uh, they give a great example of smartphones and iPads and HDTV. Maturity phase would be something like uh, MP3 players, uh, laptop, computers, microwaves. All those are great examples of products that are actually in the maturity phase. And then the decline phase are the things like one of my favorites has to do with the standalone fax machine. Nowadays, you still can get fax machines, but it's combined with a scanner and a printer. You see very few standalone fax machines nowadays. So that definitely is a market that is on a decline uh, or in a decline phase. So that's it. If there's any questions to it, always feel free to uh, send an email to me, or we can always talk in class. Good luck.